Now, the interesting thing about celiacs, of course, they're not really a disease problem per se, but they're a big issue. Uh, we don't have a vaccine for celiacs, and it's kind of like the fish vaccine, holy grail, is to produce a celiacs vaccine. In fact, I think producing a vaccine for an parasite would be quite a challenge. Uh, and then, of course, we need alternatives to the treatments that people use, uh, and we want to know more about resistance. So right now, we use a drug called Slice. It's, a, it's kind of like ivermectin. It's a macrocyclic lactone. Um, it's very effective for treating uh, lice. It's used all around the world. The problem is that everywhere it's used in the world, except BC, there's resistance to this drug, and it's caused a lot of problems. So, you know, if you rely on uh, pharmaceuticals uh, for controlling parasites, you'll eventually run into problems, and the farmers are very concerned about this. So we want to have solutions for dealing with uh, sea lice, and of course the other thing is vaccines. Aquaculture, the biggest advances in aquaculture around the world for managing fish health and disease have come through from vaccine technology. Um, and the interesting thing about the vaccines, and every fish that's farmed, is basically every salmon at least, and probably others, that's farmed is vaccinated. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. Uh, they're vaccinated by injection, actually. Each single one. I don't know how many million smolts there are in the world, but each one gets a shot in the arm. Um, <laughs> vaccines have had a profound uh, impact on the management of disease and aquaculture, but all these vaccines are actually made by brute force. They're sort of cook and kill vaccines, and only recently have people started to use genetic technologies to produce recombinant vaccines. We now have a licensed DNA vaccine, and we're starting to see application for things like um, RNAi uh, type of vaccines. And then, of course, there's diseases like Kadoa and Loma and other uh, very complicated parasites where we don't really have any idea where they come from. We have obviously no vaccines, we have no treatments, and they do cause issues for farmers. And the last thing I talked about is harmful algae. Algae is a big issue on the coast because of the way that eutrophication goes on. We do get algae blooms. Um, we have spent a lot of time collecting samples, looking at samples, but you'd be surprised at how little we know what's in those samples. There's a couple of major species that people have identified but there's many more species that they don't identify, they just sort of write them down, uh, and there's a big need for characterizing what's going on. Some other non-health issues are things like diagnostics. We talked a lot about diagnostics, and i just um, make a couple of comments about diagnostics. Um, you know, we don't, we don't have like a life labs framework for uh, animal health, uh, certainly don't for aquaculture, so we need diagnostic tests that are easy, cheap, and in the field. Um, of course, physiology is a big issue for growing fish. Um, fish do stress quite easily, and anything we can do to reduce stress will reduce um, susceptibility to disease, and um, they'll then grow faster, uh, and they'll get bigger, and they'll make more money for farmers. Um, and then, uh, I'm just going to mention quickly, we're circulating agriculture systems. This is uh, something that's come online. We now have uh, we've always had farms producing um, smolts using grass. Um, these are sites that recycle 99% of the water. We now have a site that's actually producing herbicides, fish using this technology. The heart of these systems are the biofilters, and the biofilters are these very complicated microbial communities. And uh, there's a real need now to better characterize and understand how these uh, microbial communities uh, form, how they evolve and adapt and change in the systems. And one of the big issues, of course, is that if you have a problem with the RAS system and you want to treat your fish, you can't, because if you then go and kill that biofilter, you've destroyed your whole farm. So uh, it's something that's an area that was flagged at a meeting I was at just last week where we need to do more research on uh, biofilters and biofilms in recirculating agriculture systems. And then, of course, the last thing, the thing that I think is probably the most um, promising, of course, is uh, genetics. And we just heard a little bit about that. And of course, in the day, we used to go out to the river, we used to collect fish, bring them back to the hatchery, and then we'd have, you know, set up 30 families, we'd pick tag all the fish, and then we'd have to scan the fish, you know, find the pit tag number, weigh them, do all this stuff, and it was very laborious. Well, now, of course, we have a lot of genetic tools that can bypass that. What's well, really interesting about the BC agriculture industry is despite the value of the salmon industry, we do not have a decent breeding program that uses things like market-assisted selection for improving the productivity of the, of the industry. And I think that's something that's um, really missing. So I was, there's just a couple of comments that I had, um, if I have time. 
uh, on, on Broodstock. Uh, you know, looking at things like Broodstock, if you're thinking about a Broodstock project, I still think, uh, and the industry told me this at the time, although I heard something different this morning, uh, that the number one priority is growth. If you can solve a problem like, um, take IHN, which is one of the viruses that we have naturally on the coast, you know, we have a vaccine for that that's really quite effective, so would you, would you manage that with a breeding program, or would you try and focus your breeding plan on growth? And clearly, the faster you can grow your fish, the less time they're in the water, the less risk to the farmer, the more money he's going to make. So I think breeding is the number one priority. Uh, sea lice, I mentioned that a little bit. Um, infrastructure, talked a little bit about that in terms of diagnostics and what we have available. A lot of these farms are in communities that are hard to get to. Uh, they, some of them don't even have roads to them. Uh, and so, you know, for example, if you develop a diagnostic kit, you've got to be able to you know, have an infrastructure that supports that technology. And all these technologies, whether it be a drug or a vaccine or a diagnostic kit, has to be, uh, you've got to be able to commercialize it. So with the diagnostic kits, they're very expensive to, um, uh, to license. Uh, it takes a long time. They're licensed to a really high standard. Uh, and the margins are actually quite low for a lot of these products. So it's very difficult for companies to get engaged in that. Vaccines, the same thing. You know, I read a lot of research proposals. And a lot of times, it's really funny to see how someone will say, well, we're going to start this research. And in about three years' time, according to our research plan, we're going to have a product that the industry is going to use. Uh, and therefore, we, you know, we should get the money, which is really not a realistic time for licensing a veterinary uh, vaccine or pharmaceutical. And I know this because I did it for many years for an international pharmaceutical company. Uh, and then, of course, uh, when you develop these products, and we all want to see end products, um, uh, there's got to be, um, there's going to always be issues with respect to uh, different regulatory standards in different countries. <coughs> So I'm just going to talk a little bit about commercial fisheries applications. And one of the examples that was uh, given to me by a fisheries colleague in my office is the example of herring. So here's a pile of herring swimming around. Uh, and the herring fishery is, is about $8 million in landed value. And most of it is based on the boat, right? So here's uh, herring. Here's the row. People like to eat the row. Um, and the problem, of course, is, is that there's a lot of work been done. Um, and there's big issues with First Nations, recreational groups, environmental groups, uh, and other harvesters because there's this feeling out there that there's a lot of individual small stocks, but we don't really know that. And a lot of times they, we, we're told that they spawn in one area, but now they no longer spawn there. So some people would say, well, let's just get some herring from here. We'll put them over there. They'll spawn or they'll hatch there, and then when they come back, they'll come back to that spot. Of course, we don't know if any of this will work. Mm -hmm. And so. Uh, it's one of those things where, you know, a stock ID and a genomic application, I think, would um, be really helpful. So things like stock ID, stock assessment management tools, disease surveys. Most of the stuff we know about disease actually comes from farm fish, not from wild fish. Uh, and then, of course, there's a lot of tools we could use for understanding ecosystem health uh, for the fisheries. And then the last example I'll use, I was going to ask if anyone could identify this fish, because if you could, better than most fish stores. Yes, it's a sole. What kind of sole? There's a lot of species of sole out there. And they all have different price tags. We heard about this earlier on today. We were talking about fraud. Um, and this is actually a lemon sole. Uh, and this is a red snapper. There's been a lot of studies out there. And the studies show that about 20% of the fish that you see in the counter is not what they're labeled as. And this has some big issues. Um, you know, there's a study done even by like Consumer Reports where they went out bought 200 samples of fish, uh, and about 35 of them were incorrectly labeled. Of the 11 samples they had that were labeled as lemon sole, not a single one of them by DNA testing was actually a lemon sole. And with snapper, they had something like 24 samples, and only half of them were snapper. So that's kind of what they found, although I would add that um, species like uh, sea bass, Salmon, uh, in particular farm salmon, coho, um, and Atlantic salmon, bluefin, and ahi tuna, a lot of times those fish, uh, because they're MSC certified fisheries, uh, tend to have good providence, and so their labeling tends to be a lot more correct. In other cases, though, someone bought uh, a piece of fish labeled as gruber, they sent it off for uh, testing, and it came back as tilefish, so they paid a premium price for something they thought was something else, 
And of course, tilefish has a mercury warning from the FDA, so that's a kind of a bad case for fraud. Mm -hmm. um, and then last thing, of course, is traceability. Traceability will become an issue for all fisheries uh, around the world. It's going to happen on the West Coast, it's happening on the East Coast. And basically, you know, to get MSC certification, you've got to show kind of like where your fish came from. And so the way we're going to understand traceability uh, and its um, you know, uh, cold chain um, handling through the system, you've got to be able to know where your fish came from. This will, we've got to figure this out because uh, it can become a standard. Uh, how we're going to do that, I'm not really quite sure, but maybe that's uh, another uh, application. So uh, that's two examples. Um, and then, of course, diagnostics for things like um, you know, listeria. Uh, a lot of the things I mentioned we're doing already, uh, I just think we need to do them better, faster, and cheaper. Uh, and that's actually something that uh, is helpful for industry. Research is great, but you've got to have tools that, that work for, for guys out in the field. So I think with that, I've burned up my time, and that's my answering equipment for questions. But if, like I said, the slide's there. Uh, I work for the ministry. I'm very easy to find. If you have any questions, send me an email, call me up.